Father and God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for everyone who's here. And uh, Lord, just pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you in all things. Uh, as always, Father, I know there are difficulties represented here, pains, heartaches, family issues, struggles, finances, health, and, and more. And I just lift all of the requests up to you, Lord. Uh, not just physically, but of course spiritually too. Pray for the people that we know that don't know Jesus, for their salvation. Uh, pray for the body of Christ, for the churches, for the leadership, and uh, just for you to speak to us today through your word. So Lord, we commit it all to you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, welcome as always. And I um, was thinking about what to do today, and I, I think I, wanna, I wanted to step away from end time study, the covenants and things like that, and even though it's good to do deep Bible studies and look at the nuances of things, sometimes it's good to be reminded of just the main truth. Sometimes we need to be reminded of some of the core issues that are not only within Christianity and the church, but need to be within our own lives too. And you know, when we come to a Bible study or go to church or sing and things like that, you know, we, we want to exalt Christ. That's what we're all about. And of course, that's what we're about here at Zion's Hope too. And we worship and we sing and we do all these things because of who he is and what he's done. And it's also very easy to lose sight of who Jesus is in our world. You know, we get busy at church activities. You know, summer's coming, oh, VBS is coming up. Oh, gotta do this, gotta do this, gotta do this. You know, family issues, health issues, difficulties, going to the doctor, you're trying to sleep at night when you can't. You know, all this kind of stuff can really easily distract us from who Jesus is and what he's done. And we lose sight of who he is. So today, I want to address the supremacy of Christ from Colossians 1 and 2. Now, we're not gonna be able to study everything uh, and not go over a lot of details, but I, I hope this will encourage you to do some additional study in these important verses that we're gonna look at today. But first, of course, you wanna look at the context. So whenever you start a book or a study, it's always important to look at the context of the, the book or the area or chapter in which you're studying. And you just get some background, you know, politics and history, uh, geography, all those kinds of things. It's really important because it really helps you understand what the text means and means when it was written, not to us today, but when it was written. So the city of Colossae uh, is in Asia Minor, you know, modern day Turkey, uh, near Laodicea, as you can see here on the map, and it's about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Now we're familiar with the, the city of Ephesus. You can see Ephesus right over here, just kind of let you know right over there. So it's about 100 miles over that way. Uh, it actually used to be a very popular city, but by Paul's time, basically it became a, a small merchant town on a trade route. So its, it's golden age was long gone. And Paul did not found the church here in Colossae. More than likely it was Epaphras, we see that his name in 1-7, who had heard the gospel when he was in Ephesus. Paul was there, of course, for three years on his uh, missionary journey, third missionary journey in Acts 19, and he was there roughly from about 52 to 55 AD. And Epaphras, of course, heard the gospel. He was from Colossae, so he goes home, shares the gospel there, people believe. A little house church basically is started, and it goes from there. And Paul may have encouraged him to do that, of course, too, but with this new truth, I mean, what else are you gonna do but talk about it and tell others about it when you go back home? So that's what happens. This fellowship began, and it primarily consisted of Gentiles as well. Little important factor there. Now, when it comes to the actual book itself, as with Philippians, Ephesians, and Philemon, he wrote this while he was in house arrest in Rome. We see it in Acts 28. Uh, Acts and early tradition says that, others too. And then Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, 1.23, 4.18, and the early church fathers also state that Paul wrote this. The early Meritorian fragment, dated from around 180, which is the earliest list of accepted biblical books, also includes Colossians as a Pauline letter. So, you know, it's pretty easy to establish that Paul wrote this. It says it, and other things attest to that. And it was written between about 60 to 62 AD, probably closer to 62 because I found there was an earthquake in Colossae in, in 61 that kind of <laughs> destroyed a lot of things. So this, this was a struggling town and a struggling little church. And you say, well, why was it written? Well, it was written because there was some gross heresy within the church, believe it or not. 
It's hard to specifically state what it was because there's many facets to it and there's many different views as to what that one or what that could be. One of those views is this, and this is a quote from the Reformation Study Bible. The Christians in this letter were struggling with a Greek influence form of Jewish philosophy that viewed Christians as still vulnerable to spiritual forces. It was thought that these forces needed to be placated or appeased through veneration, through some sort of asceticism of food and drink, and by honoring certain days prescribed in the Old Testament ceremonial law. The epistle is designed to help Christians understand that in order for them to gain acceptance before God, they need Christ only. Now there's a few other possibilities, and uh, one of those is this. Others say that uh, this error, or part of the error, be eventually became Gnosticism, and you've probably heard that phrase if you've done any kind of study. Now this belief basically said there's a special secret knowledge that you must have that's necessary for salvation. And guess what? Only they had it. No one else did. Be aware of a group or a person or a so-called church or an organization that says, we only have this truth, so you've got to come to us for this. Don't go. Don't fall into that. That's what cults do. Now for them, this was not just intellect. They defined, it's basically platonic thought, spirit is good, physical is bad. Now that can lead to one of two things, and we also find this in the New Testament, but also in history too. It leads to indulgence of fleshly desires, you know, food and sex and rituals. Why? Because the flesh means nothing, so just do whatever you want to do. License. Then there's asceticism or self-denial. That's where legalism comes in. Ceasing from certain foods and certain practices also comes in. And this was the issue in Colossae, at least in part. So add that, that legalistic stuff and all that to the Jewish practices and you really get like a, a mixed bag of jelly beans of theology or basically spaghetti theology. You know, it could be this and this and this, you know, buffet, basically. So that's another view. Um, another view is this. They were heavily influenced by Jewish and pagan folk belief, like tribal beliefs. Uh, part of this was to call upon angels for protection against evil spirits. And within this view, a shaman-like personality apparently arose within the church, presented himself as a spiritual guide who had insights to the spiritual realm and encouraged people to do these rites and rituals and other means to protect them from these evil spirits and deliverance from the afflictions. And of course, that leads to legalism as well. And also an external focus on rituals, which apparently was a big part of this. So these are a few possibilities. I think it was kind of a combination of all these things, at least to a point. It's really, again, really hard to say specifically what it was. So there was at least, obviously, one leader who was promoting these things. And there was obviously some ascetic and occultic type of beliefs associated with these practices taking place here in Colossae. And it was also connected to Jewish legalistic practices from the Old Testament. So what does Paul do? Well while not denying or minimizing demonic power, he writes this letter to do what? To exalt Christ and confront the errors within this assembly. A shaman is uh, basically like a medicine man. You know, an individual who's, you've got all these, oh, got, got this stuff hanging, you know, got the staff and all those other things. You know, think of like, you know, tribal Africa, a shaman, a medicine man. Uh, witch doctor. Witch doctor, yeah, that's another way to put it, exactly. You know, and then he would have a, maybe a big personality or maybe he says he has this insight to the spiritual realm. You know that, that voice that you hear you know, when you watch TV or on, online stuff? You know, oh, the spiritual insights of so-and-so. <laughs> You're like, okay, great, yeah. But that's what was going on. And whenever the truth is proclaimed in an area, lies and deception always flood in after it because the devil wants to overtake those things. It happens all over, all over the world, all the time, Whenever there's mission work, whenever there's gospel work going on, this is what occurs. And you've got to deal with it, you've got to confront it, just like Paul did. So he writes this letter. Now we're going to study three areas where we find the supremacy of Christ in the letter and of course also in life. Creation, redemption, and religion. Now we're not going to be able to read all the text, but I do want to encourage you again to go back and read everything and, and look at the, the full context. So first of all, as we go through this selection, we're going to look at the supremacy of Christ in creation. And we'll look at chapter 1, verses 15 and 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. So here we have the introduction to our study here. Verses 15 to 20, by the way, are probably an early Christian hymn sung about Jesus. Paul includes that here, as, as we just read part of it. And if so, the Colossians probably were familiar with this, and I really want you to think about what Paul is writing here. He's writing about Christ. What does he say about him? Some amazing, amazing things. First of all, when it comes to creation here, the image of God. Verse one, or sorry, chapter one, verse 15. He that is Jesus is the, the image, the Greek word icon. The word means copy or likeness. You know, we use the, the, the figure of speech, he's a chip off the old block, you know, or something like that. Like father, like son, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And the writer of Hebrews also says something similar in Hebrews 1.3. Jesus is the express image of his person and exact representation of his nature. John 1.18. Jesus says no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He, Jesus, has made him known. John 14.9. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And of course, we know who Jesus is. He's the eternal Son of God, but the church in Colossae was struggling with some of this stuff. I mean, when you got these spiritual forces within a very superstitious pagan culture that are vying for you know, who's going to be in authority, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, you have to understand, okay, wait a second, Jesus is over these things. He's more powerful than these things. Why? Because he's the eternal son of God. He came in human form to die for our sins, to rise again, to ascend into heaven, to come back one day. He's going to rule the earth. He came to show us God's character also too, as we see here because he was and always will be God. Only God can explain who God is. You realize that? You know, we, we do our attempts <laughs> trying to de describe God, but only God can tell us who he really is. And Jesus, of course, did that. He declared the Father. So him, as the exact likeness of God in human flesh, points us to the Father because he is the Son. He's the image of God. But Paul also says that he's specifically the creator in verse 16. He's the creator, not a created being, contrary to what the cults say. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1 through 5, declares Christ's supremacy also as the creator over all things, just as Paul does here. And Paul gives some specific examples in the heavens and on the earth. What does he say? Thrones. Well, you know, you think of Rome. You think of the government. You think of Caesar. You think of local authorities. Well, okay, there's the thrones. Well, there's the rulers or dominions, the authorities, the powers, or authorities also, depending upon your translation. Now, this refers to the, how, how the Jews ranked the angelic beings at that time. So Paul's actually talking about this Jewish ranking of angels. And he mentions other places, too, which I'll get to in a second. It's like saying, you know, sergeant, captain, general basically. It's a rank. Different responsibilities, different roles within the angelic realm. You know, we think of Michael, who is the, the fighter or the defender of Israel. There's different ranks of angelic beings, and he mentions this in 2.10 and 2.15, and then he adds the elementary principles of the world in 2.8 and 2.20. So basically, he says this, whatever authority you can think of in heaven or on earth, Jesus has supremacy over them. Period. Why? Because he created them. <laughs> he created these angels, even the angels that fell and became demons. He originally created them too. But part of the being the, the creator is also the fact that he is the sustainer in verse 17. He's before all things, and it's because of him that all things hold together, all things consist, which is a very fascinating thought, by the way. Did you know that really scientists have a hard time figuring out how atoms are held together? You know that? They don't know. Why? Because scientifically they should go <laughs> They shouldn't be held together by anything. They should all explode. I'm glad they don't, <laughs> by the way. But it's a mystery to them. But you know what? We know how. He holds it together by his power, by his authority, because he is supreme over creation. 
It is by his power that every atom in the universe does not explode at this very moment. Still held together. Our heart beats because of his power. We are held together by his power as individuals, but also as the body of Christ. He is a sustainer, and we depend upon him for everything. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Paul said in Philippians. He does not depend on us. Now, Paul says similar things in Acts 17, which we saw before in the other series I did, to the Greek philosophers. He, God's a creator. He's a sustainer. Paul's saying the same thing here, reminding the Colossians, hey, Jesus is supreme. Don't forget that. He is supreme in creation because he's the creator. But also, too, verses 18 to 23, we see the supremacy of Christ in redemption. Let's read those verses. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you, Gentiles, were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Wonderful verses there. So what's Paul say here regarding redemption? Well, first of all, he's the head of the church. Verse 18a. Jesus is the leader of the church, not a pastor, not an elder, not a bishop, not any individual or group or body or whatever committee you want to have come into your mind. God uses them, yes, but they are not the head or the leader of the church. Christ is. We have forgotten this in many evangelical churches in the world today, and it's become a mess. We are his church. We belong to him and not vice versa. He's not there at my beck and call. I am there at his beck and call. And when any leader you know, thinks it's about them, guess what? That church or ministry is done. Even if they have hundreds of thousands or millions of people. We have seen this repeatedly within church history. As church leaders, denominations, and more continue to fall and fail and stumble and bring a reproach on the name of Christ. And it's very, very sad. I've seen it happen. Maybe you've been in a church where it's happened, where the, the leadership has fallen or stumbled or sinned greatly. It is hard, it's difficult, it's painful to see this. Church and ministry leadership with the congregations and those who make up those ministries should be seeking him for decisions, for direction, for provision, and for more. Because we depend upon him. Because our salvation is in him. And now he is in us by his spirit. He's also our example. Now, yes, leadership should be an example too, but we look to him for how to act, what to say, how to think, what to do, and how to behave in this crazy, insane, mixed up world that we live in and more so as time goes on. But he's the head of the church. Paul never claimed this. He says, follow me as I follow Christ, but only as I follow Christ. <laughs> Paul never claimed to be the head or the leader or the main man. What did he call himself, the least of the apostles? Even though he was still an apostle. So we need to look to Christ. And, and I just wanna pause for a second. The church that you attend is Jesus the head? If not, you need to talk to leadership. Seriously. Paul also says Jesus is the firstborn. 118b, this also takes us back to 115 because this is the second time we see this word. Now again, this is where cults and ancient heresies use this verse out of context. Oh, Jesus is firstborn. He's a created being. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that. 
this word does not mean he was created or born as we think. Little Greek here. The Greek word is prototokos or prototokos, and it means preeminent, having priority in rank or time. You go back to Deuteronomy 21, 17, Exodus 4, 22, and they state that the firstborn son had specific and certain rights that others didn't have. Now, it's a, it's a big study in itself, but I just want to give you a summary here. But it's important because Paul is actually talking about who Jesus is and what he came to do. The firstborn was preeminent. He had a place of honor within the family because it was his responsibility to now lead that family forward after the death of the father, historically speaking. Uh, he had authority, he had dignity. Uh, he was also the heir of everything the father had. For that, go to Hebrews 1, verse 2, and it says Jesus is heir of all things. So it's connected to this too. This doesn't mean that the one born first was always considered, quote, the firstborn. Think of Esau and Jacob as one example. God made exceptions there. But the idea involves rank, uh, rights, privileges other than the actual birth order. And here Paul is saying, for the second time, Jesus is the firstborn. He has certain rights. He has certain responsibilities. He is the preeminent one that we need to look to rather than these false teachings that were prominent there. Well, he's also prominent in salvation and supreme in salvation because he is not just the firstborn, but he's also God and man. Verses 19 and 20, and also chapter two, verse nine. He's 100% God, 100% man. Not 50% God and 50% man, no. He's 100% God and 100% man. He's the God-man, as theologians talk about. And this is a core doctrine in Christ, the text says, the Father was pleased to fill him with his fullness. Other translations say he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And this actually takes us back to the Old Testament. Think about this. Think about the tabernacle, where God filled the tabernacle with his presence there with the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. They could see the, the, the cloud and the fire from there. Whoa. He also filled Solomon's temple with his presence, so much so they couldn't even go in. Well, what does Paul say? Well, here, the Father fills Jesus, the Son, with the fullness of who he is. Basically, all that the Father is, the Son is in human flesh. And that's exactly what Jesus said. That is who he is, 100% God and 100% man. But he's also the reconciler. God was doing something through Jesus, and he, this reconciler, gives us a variety of things mentioned in the text. Forgiveness of sin, verses 13 and 14, and also verse 20. Years ago, I did a series on salvation. I actually redid that at the church where I was pastoring for a while, and one of the messages I wanted to do was on forgiveness. You ever heard a message on forgiveness? Yeah, yeah. What is it though? How you forgive other people, right? Yeah. When I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, I have never heard a message on what it means to be forgiven by God. I had never heard it. I was like, heard bits and pieces here and there, you know, but I was like, I'll do that message. And I looked at it, and it, was, it's, it blows your mind when you really understand what it means for God to forgive you of your sins. All the illustrations, all the examples, recognizing even what Paul says here is that he's nailed it to his cross. That God declares you not guilty anymore. This is one of the largest truths found within Christianity and it's not found in other religions. We don't try to get God to forgive us through legalism or asceticism or ritualism or through tapping into spiritual forces or blah, 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 blah. No, not at all. God forgives us based upon what Jesus did and our faith in him. His death, his resurrection, when we trust in his work and not ours. He makes us and washes us white as snow. Even though we are sinners, he declares us right with him. Which brings us to the next one, reconciliation. I say, well, I've heard that word before. What exactly is that? <laughs> it's a change in attitude and relationship from warfare to peace. 
the ceasing of hostility. To put it another way, where there was once war in a relationship, there's now peace. That's reconciliation. Brought back together in a right relationship with someone. And in Jesus, God could bring back a right relationship with depraved human beings back to himself because of the perfect life and the perfect sacrifice and resurrection of his son. God did that. 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, there's forgiveness, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So if you've been reconciled to God and if you're a Christian, you have, then we are to go out and we are to proclaim that same truth to others. And here's the hard part, live it out. That's where it's hard. That's where it's hard. Well, how did God do this? By his blood. By his blood. By the sacrifice of Christ who willingly gave his life as a ransom for many. Brings us to Hebrews 9.22. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Because this pictures the actual sacrificial system of the Old Testament where they had to bring animals every single day with the tabernacle, with the temple. And when you blew it personally, oh, here's my animal. Hey, good to see you again. Yep, my third time today. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go again. Oh, here's my other animal. <laughs> Shedding of blood. But that was only temporary. It couldn't forgive sin, but only cover it for a short period of time until you blew it again. <laughs> or for the nation, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Every year, every year. Animals being sacrificed all the time as a substitute for the sinfulness of humanity. But in Christ, because he was our substitute, the final sacrifice, and we are now forgiven by his blood and reconciled with God, and we can be with other people. So there's uh, number two, supremacy of Christ in salvation or whichever phrase you want to put in there. Now we come to the supremacy of Christ in religion. And we are going to read verses 1 through 23 here, so I want to just kind of wanted, to, wanted you to hear the verses because they're kind of scattered throughout when you put these things together in a little bit of an outline form. But here we go. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for those who do have not personally seen my face that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and that they would attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this to you, or say this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, I, I am nevertheless with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your orderly manner and the stability of your faith in Christ. You hear Paul's heart here? I mean, think about what, don't just think about the words, but think about why he's writing this. He says, I want you to be stable. I want you to be united together. Verse six, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus in the Lord, so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Here's how you're supposed to act. See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world rather than in accordance with Christ. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells or of deity dwells in bodily form and in him you have been made complete and he is the head over every ruler and authority. He goes back to the same truth. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you, Gentiles, again he's talking to the Gentiles here, were dead in your wrongdoings and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our wrongdoings. Well, how did he do that, Paul? Having canceled it, or canceled the certificate of debt consisting of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. 
Now there's a whole bunch of historical stuff right there I would encourage you to look at because this is referring to a debt letter that would be, be nailed to a, like a cross and say the debt's been paid. So I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff there. Verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him, that is, the spiritual forces you Colossians are afraid of, Jesus has already disarmed. They have no power over you unless you give it to them. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are only a shadow of what's to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize by delighting in humility and the worship of the angels. Taking his stand on visions, he has seen inflated with the cause of his fleshly mind and not holding firmly to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why? As if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things being destined to perish with use. That is, it's going to go away anyways. You know, hey, got some, something to drink here. Mmm. Yummy, okay, now it's in my stomach, it's gone. It perishes with use. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of man, these are matters which do have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and humility and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. They can't change the human heart. It's only external. So whatever was going on within this Colossian assembly, again, was a mixed bag of superstitious nonsense and occultic danger. In contrast, what does Paul do? Again, he exalts Christ as supreme within religion itself. And we see that here. Well, how so? How do we find out how Christ is supreme in these beliefs? Well, Paul does this. He says, well, we see that he's supreme in knowledge and wisdom. We find that in Christ. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and 8 through 10, and 20 through 23. This is in contrast to this worldly persuasive words and <coughs> secret knowledge that Paul's warning them against. These false teachers said, you gotta know more about what they say rather than what Christ says and who he is. If somebody exalts him, his self or herself over Jesus, that's a pretty good indication that they're a false teacher. But you'd be surprised how easy deception happens all the time all the time. They added to the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ, but in contrast, Paul says, hey, true knowledge, true wisdom are found where? In Jesus. Look to him. He's, he warned them, don't be deceived. Now, I want to make sure you understand this, too. Paul was not against studying wisdom, which we know as philosophy. What he's talking about here is the philosophy and its connection to occultism. That was the historical understanding of philosophy in that day. That's specific practices and assumptions of tradition and through other things. So he's not talking about the philosophy that we think of necessarily. There's some really good Christian philosophers, by the way. But there was this, this mysterious thing behind there that he's warning them against. And I would warn you against too. So knowledge and wisdom in Christ. Then there's the adequacy of Christ. That's basically the entire chapter. <laughs> And again, this is in contrast with the warnings against man-made traditions or the extremes of the Old Testament laws. Sabbaths, new moons, all this, that's, that's found in, in the law. He was warning them and us against legalism. What is that? That is the use of religious practices and traditions to try to get on God's good side and attain forgiveness and stay on his good side and retain forgiveness. Now in Colossae, their religious practices also included these Jewish practices that Paul even mentions here. What is that? Circumcision, Sabbath keeping, maybe ceremonial washings, which is why he talks about baptism, and more. Now, Paul himself would very easily tell you the law is good. He was not against the law <laughs> at all. But he would also say, you know what? It couldn't save anybody. It was limited. Only faith in Christ can save you. Not all these ritualistic things that are only external. Jesus is adequate in contrast to legalism. 
So Paul warned them against legalism, but also he warned them against asceticism. Asceticism. Don't touch, don't taste, don't eat, etc. This is part of it, legalism, but basically staying away from certain things leads some people to think, oh, you're more holy than them. You know, years ago in America, had the, the fundamentalist movement. Now, there were some good things that came out of that, but there's also a lot of legalistic things that came out of it too. We've got our list of 10 things. You know, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do. That means I'm a holy man. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you base your Christianity on what you don't do, what form of Christianity is that? Because you're focusing on yourself rather than on Christ. But asceticism is part of this too. Because staying away from certain things doesn't make you more or less holy while you're under grace. Think about that. Now you may have your personal preferences, you have your convictions, that's good, we should have those. But also to push those on others, that's called sin. That's what we also call legalism in our world today. So don't push those things, but also don't think that that makes you more holy than other people that may or may not do those things. It's all about grace. It's all about grace. Also, too, Paul warned against charismaticism. That's a word I made up, by the way. <laughs> That's an extreme where people are always saying, oh, I had a vision, oh, I've got a dream, I've got a word for you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if God wants to do that sometimes, he can do it. That's up to him. But I will say this, anybody who is always saying this, you need to be aware of them and beware of them. I have seen this happen. They are denying scripture and it is spiritual poison. Why is that the case? Because you always end up depending upon those things rather than on God. I've seen it occur. Mm -hmm. Again, God, if God wants to do that at times, that's up to him. But there is a danger to rely upon those super supernaturalistic type things that are supposed to always happen, always happen, always happen, always happen. But people get hyped up and it becomes like a drug. You gotta go get your fix every week. Again, I, I, I've seen this occur and it's sad. Because you rely upon those things rather than on Christ who provides for us and provides maturity for us. So be very careful. Christ is adequate, so is his word. So I'm not slamming any particular group or anything like here, but I'm just warning you against things that are taking place and actually are gonna grow in the future. Next, the authority of Christ, verses 18 and 19. This is in contrast with the worship of angels. Worship of angels. Really? Yeah, they worshiped angels. They certainly did. And there was a belief in that time where the Jews even practiced it to a point too. And he's warning of these dangerous and false religious practices. Again, you see here, angel worship was actually part of some groups within Judaism. Why? Because they were the mediators of the law, it says in Hebrews. And it fit together <laughs> very, very well with some of the pagan practices and worship of the other entities, the demigods or the spiritual beings, and we just substitute them and stick them in here too. So here we apparently see this worship of angels taking place in Colossae. Or maybe a participation within worship, or another possibility is they were using them as a mediator. Ever hear spirit guides? What do you think they are? They're demonic beings. So this may have been actually taking place to a point in Colossae too. You say, well, why is this so dangerous? Well, this mediatorship was supposed to give you special insight or ecstatic utterances, which made you look more spiritual. Also a problem in, in Corinth too, by the way. Why is this dangerous? Well, if this was the case, because there was a growing Gnostic belief that there were these this, this host of beings between God and man that existed and they were the mediators and Christ was one of them. So Jesus was not God himself but part of this intermediary mediation along with the other angels. So again, th this is why it's dangerous to get into this kind of stuff. Jesus is not equal with the angels, but he's the captain of the Lord of hosts. 
He is the captain of the armies of the angels. Why? Because he created them. Remember what he said? I could call down, I, my father and I could call 12 legions of angels right now <laughs> and take care of these guys. <laughs> so be careful. And I just want to warn you real quick too. It's good to study angels. Don't pray to them. Don't seek them. Don't think that uh, you can do whatever you want. I've got my own personal guardian angel. I'm going to go out and do some stupid stuff. Don't do that. <laughs> You'll find out real quick that that doesn't, have, that doesn't work. Be careful of that. And be careful of people who are always talking about angels and angelic beings and angelic hosts, angelic visitations and all this stuff. Be careful. Continuing under the authority of Christ. Again, Christ had and has authority over those angelic beings, which they were afraid of, and I'll get to that in here in a second, because he was the original creator of them. Paul also says, hey, Christ has authority over the church. He mentions it once again. Goes back to 118. He says, stop worshiping, stop involving yourselves in these religious practices that demean the authority of Christ and exalt the authority of other created beings. He has authority over all of these things. And I just mentioned that fear may have been a factor. And I say it because of this. When, you, when you've studied other religions and been in other parts of the world and you see how they do things and why they do things, you recognize that a lot of pagan rituals and religions are based in fear. Fear of what these spirits are going to do to me. Fear of what my ancestors are going to think of me. Fear of what the demons are going to do. Fear, fear, fear. It's one of the... the, the grasps that Satan has over the world. And many have these religious practices because of fear. And the, the ancient mystery religions, the ancient and modern pagan practices and more are based in fear. And fear leads people to do some, to do some very strange things, some very uh, bizarre and dangerous religious things. Remember uh, Elijah and the, prop, the prophets, quote unquote, of... Uh, Baal, Baal, Jezebel, what were they doing? What did they do? What was, what was their worship? Jumping up and down, cutting themselves from morning until evening. That's their religious practice. Because you've got to appease this God, otherwise he's going to get you. He's going to get you. Watch out! Don't do that! But that was fear. And it still has a stronghold over many people today. So what's the solution? What is, how is Christ supreme in religion? Well, faith and life in Christ. That's what it comes down to. Again, contrasted with the warning, warnings against this secret knowledge and strict self-denial. Paul says, as you receive Christ, continue to walk in him. Well, how do they receive him? By faith, by God's grace. Continue to walk in faith, continue to walk by faith. Rather than in these practices that you brought into the church which are now hindering you and destroying you. They and we will never find life or find eternal life in any man-made religion, any practice, tradition, or particularly in occultism. We find new life in Christ by faith alone. Now as we finish up, usually I'll do a review of everything, but I just want to ask us some questions, and I mean some hard-hitting specific questions, direct for those of us here and for those of you who are watching. First of all, we must have a proper understanding of who Jesus is and what he did. Do we? Now there's of course always more things to learn, more things to understand, so we must take the time to read and study and pray and get to know him more every day. As hard as it is, he must be the center of our lives and our families, our churches, ministries, businesses, whatever it is, because everything we need, we find in him. Don't accept a cheap substitute. Whether philosophical, religious, spiritual, mystical, experiential, or otherwise unbiblical. Don't accept cheap substitutes. If he's at the center, then guess what? We're not going to fear what man can do to us or what Satan can do to us. And also, we will remember that he is the provider for us because he is our sustainer not just as a church in general, but personally too. And as we move forward by faith. 
Here's another question. Are you superstitious? You would find so many Christians are so superstitious. It is so sad. It is so sad. Do you pray to angels or dead saints? Do you have a necklace or amulet that you hold on to hoping it's going to protect you? Do you think that uh, it's going to protect you from bad luck or the demonic realm? If so, you're denying the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in your life. You need to repent and get rid of that stuff. This occult philosophy is prominent in the world and even in the church today. Superstitious things. It's unfortunate. It's very sad. Be discerning. Number three. Do we walk by faith? And this is one that, that smacks me in the face all the time. So I'm, I'm right there with you, okay? Do we allow circumstances to determine our life? This is hard, and again, it's hard for me. It's a struggle, I confess that. So this message is as much a reminder for me as it is an encouragement for you all to walk by faith. Number four, have you been taken captive or are you in bondage to false ideas, false teachers, or false doctrine? Ask yourself some questions, because you may not know. Do the teachers I listen to exalt themselves or exalt Jesus? No, I don't just mean talk about Jesus. I mean, do they put him in the position that he is at the right hand of the Father, supreme Christ, coming again, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Savior, the sustainer, the creator, all of what Paul is saying here and so much more. Do they exalt Christ or do they demean him? Here's another question. Does the doctrine I believe exalt me exalt a church, a church leader, or Jesus? Ask the Lord to show you. Because we all have stuff that we're, we have baggage with. We all do. There's all stuff that we're trying to get rid of and, and, and deal with. But ask the Lord to show you what you've embraced that's worldly and not biblical and ask him to help you get rid of it. And to fill your mind and your heart and your life with the truth of what he says. Here's another one. Last, number five. Do you just add Jesus to your beliefs? Happens a lot in other countries. You go to India, you go to other places. Yes, I believe Jesus, along with this God and 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 this God. And this God. They just add kind of as a, you know, a, a pot of stew. And it happens. And even within the quote unquote church, we add Jesus to our life rather than him being at the center of our lives. Is he at the center of our beliefs? There is a difference. There is a difference. And to worship anything or anyone other than Jesus, God, is idolatry, flat out. I want to leave you with this. Colossians 1, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, may you speak to us today. Now, a little bit of a different kind of message today. Encouragement, but also a challenge. Lord, search our hearts. There, there, are, there, there are areas in all of our hearts where we need help, Lord. So shine your light and show us where Christ is not supreme and help him to become supreme in our lives, in our families, in our churches, so that we may honor you and glorify you because you are worthy. And Lord, for those who may not even know you, whether here or even watching, I pray, Lord, that you'll work in their hearts and show them who Jesus is and what he came to do, to die for sinners like us, so that we may receive salvation by faith because of your great grace. And we ask it in his wonderful name, amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. 
Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.